Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Governance for Everyone, Five Building Blocks for a Stress-Free uh, Microsoft 365 World. My name is Joelle Palmer, and I'm a director here at CoreView. Um, before we get started, I want to cover just a few housekeeping rules. Um, to avoid interruptions during the broadcast, all audience phone lines are on mute. In your audio panel, you may select to listen to this broadcast using your computer speakers, or you may select the telephone option to view the dial-in number. If time permits, our session will include live Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation mm -hmm. using the questions panel located at the right of your screen. After the webinar, we'll be sending out a quick five minute survey. Um, please take five minutes to share your opinion on today's presentation and give us feedback. That helps us ensure that the content is useful and valuable for future, future webinars. Um, and finally, we'll email a link to the recording playback to all attendees on today's broadcast within the next few days. And with that, I will pass it over to Kasha Novitska to kick us off. Kasha, take it away. Thank you, Joel. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. So my name is Kasia Novitska. I'm product marketing manager at CoreView uh, with the company for the last four and a half years, um, also working as a solution architect before. Uh, so I had the privilege to talk with a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, prospects, clients, and customers. Uh, this is why I feel I can uh, contribute to this uh, webinar moving forward. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is David Mascarella. I'm one of the co-founder of CoreView and the chief global strategist. Uh, here in CoreView, I'm taking care of uh, continuously implementing and uh, uh, evolving the product uh, to deliver more value for our customer. Thank you. Yep, and that leaves me. My name is Roy Martinez. I'm the technology evangelist here at CoreView. Um, I've been a huge advocate of Microsoft 365 governance uh, for the better part of my career. I started out in the um, collaboration content space back before there was such a thing as Teams, and I've kind of seen it grow over time. Worked with a huge number of um, clients, big and small, and I've kind of watched the space grow, and I'm really excited to kind of share what I can for this particular session. Um, one thing that uh, we're going to do here, just to save on bandwidth, uh, I think now that we've introduced ourselves, I'm gonna go off camera just to make sure that we have uh, proper bandwidth to let the uh, the presentation go undisturbed. So Kasha and David, if you guys wanna jump off camera as well, you're welcome to at this point, but uh, just FYI for those that are wondering why my camera disappeared. So I think, there we are. Great, so yeah, I'll start us off here. Um, we have a, a an agenda here to go through, so today, we're talking all things governance for Microsoft 365 and the way that we have kind of strategized what that looks like. Order of operations today, we do have a governance survey that we submitted out uh, ahead of today's webinar. So we'll start with a review of some of those results just to get a sense of what the lay of the land looks like. And we'll probably revisit these results at the end once we've had some time to contextualize with the webinar's content. But then jumping right into it, uh, the first thing we'll start with after our results is the what we consider the five blocks that represent an effective governance map or strategy. We're gonna talk then specifically about the um, uh, Microsoft 365 disciplines for cloud governance and the framework they've designed. And then we're gonna jump into some real world examples. This will probably be the majority of our webinar uh, for this session. And then we'll wrap things up with a conclusion, kind of revisit those um, uh, survey results and, and take it from there. So to kick things off, let's talk about the survey. And the survey was interesting. We, we basically threw out a handful of questions to the field uh, in preparation for today's webinar. And uh, some of the things that we got back were particularly interesting. So I wanted to kind of highlight those results and just frame things up a bit. So one of the first questions we asked was, how um, are you know how the market rates their current maturity of their governance strategy for Microsoft 365? We gave them a scale of one to ten, where one was 
a very, very least developed uh, in terms of maturity, and 10 was the most established, right? And generally speaking, and as expected, we kind of, you know, the halfway mark is where we see things right now. We also asked what were the biggest challenges facing, and this is kind of an open-ended um, text field, so we just allowed people to answer how they want, and we got a huge smattering of, uh, of answers here, some very interesting. Obviously, things like user management, uh, client management, uh, general maturity. Uh, one thing I see on here uh, that Kasha pointed out to me earlier was that recently acquired note, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I think we'll, uh, we'll we'll come back to this and and, and talk about maybe what, uh, what what all that means and how we can uh, uh, directly affect that. How long does it take to discover breached policies or anomalies? Uh, this one was particularly interesting to me. Um, 61%, a pretty significant majority, straight up and simply does not know how long it takes to discover and or remediate uh, breach policy uh, or anomalies uh, in their strategy. So this is interesting and concerning for obvious reasons, and we'll talk through some ways that we can kind of speak to that. And then finally, which of the five disciplines, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, uh, takes top priority for the market in terms of how they govern. Um, the five disciplines we'll go through in a moment, but as you can see here, the big um, leader, uh, and as we expect, is that security baseline discipline. So that'll just set the stage for us. I think to start things off, we're gonna let David here, um, uh, once, we, once we get to the um, actual examples, we'll kind of go in order of operations. But before we get to any of that, let's just talk about what our the five building blocks that represent an effective governance strategy, at least for us here at CoreView. And the way we've mapped this out is really five key things. Number one, definition, right? What are the rules? What are the procedures? What are the policies that represent good governance, quote unquote, for an organization? And this is all about just making that definition understood. Detection, detection is about risks it's about anomalies it's about all those outliers so this is all about learning and understanding when uh risks anomalies and um, outliers occur so detecting those things evaluation or attestation this is about understanding how effective your current strategy is are the policies uh, that you have in place doing what they're meant to do are the definitions we've defined for what governance means to us uh, accurate or valid? So evaluate your current strategies, attest to their validity. Remediation, obviously, is about managing those anomalies and exceptions as they occur. So it's one thing to define your rules and procedures. It's another thing to detect them. Um, we obviously wanna make sure that that's all evaluated and attested to, but then we need to actually be able to take action and remediate on things when they occur. And this really speaks to that uh, timeline from detection to resolution. Remediation is the step that actually takes you from zero to one. And then the fifth building block for constructing what we consider to be an effective governance strategy is communication. Now, depending on who you ask, you might get different answers, but we here at Corby tend to think that communication is a pretty strong um, and important aspect of a governance strategy. It's just all about keeping your stakeholders holders informed. Um, you can have as, as good a definition and as strong a processes for detection and evaluation and all the cool remediation processes you have at play, but if people don't understand how to affect those changes or how to, um, uh, take advantage of them or even what they are, then you're really working against yourself in terms of building the most effective governance strategy you can. I wanna open the floor now to David and Kasha if they have any uh, additional commentary on these five points. Coach Kasha here. I would uh, just say before you move on, uh, because I know you'll be talking about these uh, five disciplines of cloud governance that you mentioned before, Roy. Uh, but I think I would like to just add that these are like the bare minimum steps, uh, building blocks, as we call them, for the effective governance. And I just want to bring up uh, that to many customers that I've talked to or I know uh, and talk to my peers, uh, other consultants. Uh, the problem is that a lot of these are not even um, written down anywhere. So if you are starting from the scratch with your um, governance strategy, at least these five uh, points are your starting points. 
And then within these five blocks that Roy will be covering in a moment, you should look into five all of, all of, all of these blocks within each uh, discipline. But it, I guess it's going to make more sense when Roy uh, <laughs> um, explain that. So Absolutely. You. No, but it's a good point you're making because this, this is really just the beginning, right? It, it's... It's foolish to think that you could cover everything there is to cover about governance in a single 45 minute webinar, but we wanted to make sure and just give people a sense of all those I don't knows, that 61% of the field that said I don't know, this is where you can at least start. This is a, a beginning framework to map out your governance strategy. If you can hit at least these five uh, blocks, then you're well on your way to fleshing out a proper true governance strategy. Again, is this meant to be the end all be all? Of course not. There's plenty we could talk about to unpack each one of these but we consider this to be the very fundamental uh, foundation of a good governance strategy. So, what is cloud governance according to Microsoft 365? So Microsoft 365 does have, and you can go on to um, learn.technet or whatever else and find this definitions here, but they do define five specific disciplines that encompass kind of your key focus areas for des designing a cloud governance framework. Those disciplines in order, are number one and, and up top foremost, cost management. This is about controlling costs across cloud platforms. Now there's plenty of ways that I could define cost aside from just dollars and cents, but of course dollars and cents are the most important bit. But costs can take many forms. They could be uh, hours of effort, it could be uh, human resources. There's a, a bunch of different ways to cut open costs, but managing that cost is one of the key disciplines of a good governance strategy for Microsoft 365 and cloud in general. Security baseline, this is about application and enforcement of your requirements. We talked earlier about defining your governance um, requirements and defining what it means to be well governed. Security baseline is a big part of the application and enforcement of that. Again, with a very specific lean toward uh, matters of security. And as we saw in our initial survey results, uh, the majority of our um, uh, survey result uh, set counted security as the most um, important of these disciplines for obvious reasons. Resource consistency is one of those ones that could, you know, you might be thinking, what exactly is resource consistency? The way we put that is compliance by design. We'll, we'll talk about what that means in a lot more detail later. But um, resource consistency is just about making sure that the resources that you do have, the objects, the to put it in simple terms, teams, groups, whatever the case may be, that those resources are, are consistently um, managed effectively in the same way across your organization. And when you design those um, processes to, to manage them, they're compliant in their design. And again, we'll, we'll kind of unpack that as we go. Identity baseline is around um, Consistency for identity across platforms. So whether that's um, in Azure itself, whether that's in Azure AD or Intra as we call it now, um, ensuring that same level of consistency specifically around identity and ways that we can kind of manage that in, in new uh, methods. Deployment acceleration is a little bit generic sounding, but really what this speaks to is the streamlining of the governance strategy that you defined. And the way we kind of couch it in this webinar is how we're utilizing the various uh, tooling options that are out there for us to give us the highest reward in the shortest amount of time to get from zero to properly governed. Again, this all sounds very esoteric now, but as we go through some real world examples, hopefully you'll start to see how these gel together, uh, you know, in tandem with our five building blocks to build out some ideas for you all on how you can get from zero to hero in each of these disciplines for your governance strategy. So without further ado, let's just get to the meat of it. Let's start talking about some real world examples. Uh, we'll start off with David. He'll take us through some cost management analysis. We'll go through each of these disciplines and kind of contextualize, again, our building blocks to those disciplines. So, to some extent, this will be um, a little bit of an open conversation between the three of us because uh, we all have differing um, uh, perspectives from our various fields. So hopefully this is a useful exercise for everyone to get some of this uh, insight in the way we're doing it. So David, if you want to kick us off with cost management. 
Thank you, Roy, and again, welcome to everyone uh, to this webinar. So today, as an example of uh, how Core View can innovate uh, your Microsoft 365 cost management process, uh, we will analyze uh, a common challenge faced by any organization, the management of uh, inactive license, and more importantly, how to reclaim them. So instead of talking about theory, let's deep dive uh, into a real life uh, use case of cost management. So imagine you are an IT manager and uh, you must detect uh, inactive license uh, within a specific time frame. Let's say the last 90 days. While this initial step uh, may seem challenging, you can have peace of mind knowing that uh, CoreView is ready to help. CoreView data collection and aggregation capability draw information from uh, 18 different Microsoft 365 portals uh, and multiple API, making this task a bridge. So now that you have insight uh, into the number of inactive license uh, and the employees uh, to whom they are assigned, uh, would you feel confident uh, in proceeding to reclaim that immediately? Most likely not. Uh, your next logical step uh, would be to double check uh, with uh, the employee, their manager, or an HR rep uh, to ensure that uh, removing the license uh, is indeed uh, the appropriate tool of the course of action. Let's consider a scenario where you receive a, a green light uh, to remove a license because the employees uh, has left the organization. But uh, how should you handle uh, the contact of their mailbox uh, and documenting one drive? A suitable approach uh, could involve converting the mailbox uh, into a shared mailbox uh, and granting manager right uh, to the new shared mailbox as well as the one drive. However, in a different scenario, such uh, an employee on maternity leave, uh, uh, you should refrain from tampering uh, with their license. Furthermore, it's uh, advisable to not consider the license as inactive uh, for a specific period uh, to prevent it uh, from re-entering the validation process uh, during your next license check activity. This approach ensures a smooth and not disruptive uh, experience uh, for the employee on leave. I know that uh, this process uh, could be complex uh, and time consuming, but uh, here is uh, where for you step in. It takes charge uh, identifying inactive license, uh, engaging the right stakeholder for validation, and then the magic happens. For you automate uh, the entire removal process uh, while safeguarding your data, as well as uh, empowering you to manage exception and uh, the revalidation process. Uh, so this is just an example of uh, how Core View can transform uh, your approach uh, to Microsoft 365 cost management uh, and bring uh, great benefit to your organization. First uh, and first more, cost saving. By automating process uh, like uh, license reclamation, uh, you are putting an end uh, to wasted budget dollar. Core View helps you to make every penny count. Efficiency is another key advantage. Uh, for view streamline the entire process, uh, eliminating manual work uh, and reducing the risk of error. And of course, uh, data security. For view ensure that uh, when licenses are reclaimed, uh, your data remain intact uh, and uh, accessible when needed. Uh, so no more data loss, uh, not a day. So, we just saw how CoreView can help to improve, uh, to implement uh, an effective and efficient Microsoft 365 cost management. Now it's time to talk about uh, security baseline. A security baseline is uh, a set of policy to ensure that uh, device, uh, user, and service are compliant uh, with uh, your security configuration guidelines. And this policy can derive from external or internal requirements. In a world where data security is crucial, managing misconfiguration and permission is essential. Let's uncover the risk and the solution together. Before we dive into a practical example, let's take a moment to understand the broader issue of misconfiguration and wrong permission within Microsoft 365. These issues uh, can manifest uh, in various forms, uh, such as uh, an overlay permissive sharing setting, uh, poor identity protection, uh, access rights mismanagement, uh, and uh, 
inadequate data protection in Zurich. Today, we will focus uh, on a specific example. Let's suppose uh, you have a policy that uh, prohibits uh, the automatic forwarding of email uh, to an external mailbox and see how far you can address it as part of the larger problem. As we already saw in the previous example about cost management, everything starts from the ability to timely report about the information we need to monitor. And we already learned that Corview is a game changer on this topic by providing about 700 device groups, user and service attributes you can quickly report on. Before to move forward, we should always consider that exceptions can exist and we need to manage them properly. As already mentioned, Corview provides an enterprise level exception management to avoid remediation activity being executed on them, yes. as well as provide a certification process when needed. So, now that we can promptly detect what we need to manage, and uh, we are also able to properly manage the exception, what can we do if a user with uh, an unauthorized external forward is detected? A suitable remediation process uh, could consist uh, in uh, two, let me say, simple tasks. The first one is uh, removing the external forward setting. Then uh, we could uh, send an email uh, to the user uh, to notify that for the forwarding setting has been disabled because uh, it was uh, not compliance with the policy. And uh, uh, we can also inform that uh, if uh, that setting is still right, uh, then it should follow the right procedure to ask uh, for an exception. Again, I know that uh, this process looks tedious, especially if we consider that we should check and remediate these anomalies at least daily to limit uh, the data loss uh, risk this kind of uh, non-compliance could involve. But don't worry, Corview is here to help. Uh, scanning uh, your email forwarding setting and uh, promptly flagging any unauthorized external forwarding loop. Taking into consideration your defined exception. So one flagged Corview can automatically start the remediation process and ensure ongoing compliance by monitoring and fixing your email forwarding setting over time. So Corview is uh, your partner in securing your Microsoft 365 environment against misconfiguration and wrong permission. It's the key to enhance security, compliance, and data protection by transforming your approach about uh, security baseline and configuration management. With that, I completed uh, the overview on uh, uh, the security baseline uh, and uh, I pass to Kasha. Perfect. Thank you, David. Kasha? Yeah, sure. Let's jump into the next uh, vital facet, let's say, of Microsoft 365 governance in the third discipline, uh, the resource consistency. Um, after the security uh, baseline, it looks like it's uh, another hot topic and, and, and priority for a lot of organizations. So this um, discipline is merely about uh, managing resources uh, in a consistent fashion, but it's actually elevating the level of consistency, um, ensuring that this, uh, the governance is seamlessly integrated uh, into your organizational processes. Um, think of it like a let's say, a rhythm that orchestrates governance, uh, a melody across uh, your organization, so to say. But let's walk through a day of, of a life of an IT administrator following uh, David's uh, convention. So um, there is two big challenges uh, that IT admins are um, facing if it comes to resource consistency, enforcing the guidelines across the organization resources. Um, so without automation, this task can be super daunting and very prone to error. Um, of course, uh, imagining the risk of non-compliance and security breaches uh, due to the inconsistent guideline enforcement. Um, I used to have, uh, I used to work with a customer, um, and his challenge was uh, that he had uh, local IT teams uh, in 19 different countries, um, and he was trying to enforce a simple thing as a, sort of following a specific naming convention, which I will talk about in a moment again. But he was trying to enforce that naming convention across these different local IT departments. Uh, that was nearly impossible to do, uh, no matter how many times uh, he was communicating that it was not being done. 
So uh, with the powerful automation in Corby, we were able to uh, basically review the whole directory, uh, catch the department names with the different, I don't know, spelling, the, uh, mis, mis, uh, mis uh, aligned match case, uh, things like that. And to fix this, uh, basically, with a couple of, of clicks of, of the mouse, which is imp very important. So it was not uh, with any kind of extensive PowerShell scripts and whatnot. And then we put an automation around the reports that they were constantly checking if these department names were accurate. So um, this is uh, the way that uh, I've helped this customer. And um, it was uh, basically a breeze uh, going through that exercise. Well, I know that other um, others are really struggling with that kind of challenges. Now, I mentioned standardizing naming conventions, and this is a, a big one, in my opinion, because this is not just about the organization. It's about reducing the confusion that leads to delays uh, or potential mismanagement. I would even go further. So again, uh, knowing from the field, uh, there used to be a project where um, they deployed teams very quickly during the COVID pandemic. We know uh, this scenario. Um, and uh, two uh, end users uh, had the possibility, unfortunately, to create a Teams group called Leadership. Now, what happened then is uh, that Leadership uh, knew uh, or thought uh, IT team created that uh, Teams group for them. So they started to share very sensitive information in that group. As you can imagine, this resulted in not only job loss, but also um, I think there were some criminal charges pursued. So um, what that could mean, that could mean um, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, we shouldn't be, um, let's say, disregarding basic um, settings or configurations, such as, for example, putting these policies around things like naming conventions. But also, this also indicates how important it is uh, to communicate, not only within the IT department, but with the whole organization, um, what are the potential consequences or, or even what should, what should we do and what should we watch out for? The next challenge with it, that within this uh, discipline of resource consistency is the membership regulations for groups, teams, or, or SharePoint site even. So these are vital for data security, right? So without proper enforcement, um, unauthorized access to, to these could lead to um, data leaks um, that no organization can afford. Uh, Corby can automate uh, these regulations, um, again, ensuring that only authorized individuals have access, mitigating greatly the risk of, of data breaches. Um, Roy, do we have the next point? Uh, right, so then we also have the classification for sensitive objects, and here we could uh, look at, uh, for example, again, uh, team scripts with, um, I don't know, certain sensitivity labels and, and whatnot. This is another task that is fraught with the risk of, of oversight. So without proper classification, sensitive data could fall into the wrong hands. Pretty much very similar story to the, to the previous point. Uh, so core views compliance by design, and I know that Roy already mentioned uh, that point. It's it's we advise you to think um, how you're going to have the process of creating new resources, or whether, for example, you are having this uh, scenario of uh, I don't know recent acquisition, merger, any any sort of that. So design already these policies with the compliance in mind uh, in this design process. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the governance and the regulation is, is kind of what we advise to be already built in this process, processes that minimizes anomalies and maximizes compliance and, of course, aids uh, in, uh, uh, in adopting the, the governance strategy for all. Yeah, I think uh, if, if I were to underline anything from this particular section, it's just that you you can't overlook the basic things. It's again on that whole diatribe around naming conventions. It's so it's so funny how something so simple could really snowball into something so <laughs> important, right? So again, the the whole purpose of this exercise is to take you down to the foundation level and and, and reevaluate what you're taking um, what you're putting priority into, and you can't overlook the simple things. So it's a great one, Kasha. Thanks, Roy. So the next one, the fourth one, is identity baseline. Um, I would say that establishing a robust uh, identity baseline is, is pivotal for maintaining that compliance and minimizing the strain on IT resources. I think that's the key here. 
Um, and it all starts with understanding your user's footprint um, by identifying uh, oftentimes inactive or external users. Uh, this is something that we've seen, we, we keep uh, continue seeing um, pretty much from every single customer. Very common scenario is here having a user who once collaborated on a project or users who collaborated on a project but are no longer active within the M365 environment. So what happens? Being an IT manager again, um, um, or M365 administrator, uh, people are always tasked with identifying these inactive users um, within a stipulated time, let's say, I don't know, 30 or 60 days. And it might uh, seem daunting. It is actually not that easy to do. But they get, then uh, with platforms such as CoreView, the, this process uh, becomes significantly simplified. I cannot stress how, how easy it is to do. Um, and why? Because what, why da how David mentioned, we are aggravating data from multiple M365 uh, portals, admin centers. Um, so empower, we empower you to have the insight uh, needed to pinpoint these particular users within seconds, very er effortlessly. Now, even if we are able to quickly identify inactive or external users, um, how we are starting the journey towards the attesting who should or should not um, be a member of, I don't know, a group, a team, a site and whatnot. Um, are you able to make a decision on that membership right away? Perhaps not. So here, the next sensible step would be to communicate and collaborate with relevant, um, I don't know, whether teams leads or project managers to ascertain the, the current necessity of these memberships. Um, we could look at the scenario where a user is no longer part of a project and their access to certain groups and sites is over provisioned, right? So um, it would be um, a swift action to adjust their mem membership, uh, making sure that they only have access to what's necessary, promoting a principle basically of, of least privileged. However, on the flip side, we could consider a scenario where a user is merely on a temporary leave. So, um, you know, it would only make sense to maintain uh, their membership, but flag them for review, preventing any automatic deprovisioning and ensuring a seamless transition when they're back to their job. So how do you do that today? This is my question, because um, I know that a lot of uh, IT admins would uh, rely on either extensive PowerShell scripts, uh, Excel files, or dozens, if not hundreds, of emails back and forth with, uh, with uh, managers or, or project leads to get that sorted. So this challenge is intricate and it's time sensitive because if you have to um, kind of uh, cut off uh, someone's uh, access to unauthorized um, uh, data, uh, you have to you have to do it fast. So the CoreView platform can help facilitate that real time uh, remediation and automation uh, very, uh, very swiftly near, near real time, identifying over provisioned, over permissioned users. Um, and also help you engage with the right stakeholders for the attestation. Um, so this, uh, the benefits here are pretty obvious. Of course, we are reducing the strain on um, IT resources. Um, it's, a, it's a notable advantage. Um, we are liberating basically them from uh, shackles of like manual tedious work um, and allowing them to focus on more some uh, strategic in initiatives. Um, of course, uh, we are reducing the inconsistencies and um, and making sure that uh, it's all uh, a well old machine. Uh, anybody wants to add anything to that, Roy or David? No, no. I think uh, this is another good example of like uh, a again, a lot of these things might seem like no brainer concepts, but um, the the purpose of the approach here is to take those blocks right and you know, define what is uh, appropriate for um, your, you know, timelines for offboarding, for instance. Make sure that you understand and attest to whether your processes are remediating in enough time and so on and so forth. So hopefully you can see how we're taking those five blocks, really applying them to these use cases that we've seen and, um, and uh, you know, acting on them. And it, it it doesn't stop here, right? So there's a million ways that we can enhance or augment the the current standards of how we go about um you know remediating and, and changing these things and as a matter of fact that's probably a good kickoff into the next section of our uh, of our discussion for deployment acceleration and this is about basically creating a unified experience um through whatever means whether that's through tooling or core view or whatever the case to give you the the 
tools available to kind of accelerate the adoption of your governance strategy and make sure that um, you know you're doing things according to your defined processes. Um, a couple of things just to mention in terms of deployment acceleration in regard to CoreView particularly, we have this notion of playbooks that are really like the DevOps for your governance team. It's it's the re, the, the purpose behind unified tooling is to get you from zero to a um, a good place in minimal time, right? It's acceleration of a, a deployment or of adoption. Um, we want to minimize the time to the realization of these governance strategies that we've defined. We want to push the adoption of our governance guidelines through our tooling. In other words, we don't want to just throw tools at <laughs> the problem. We want those tools to truly facilitate um, that adoption of these things. If we start with our five blocks and we make those definitions and we decide what we need to do, we need to be sure that we're taking the best means available to us to get to that goal. And we are, you know, obviously CoreView is founded on this principle that tooling can assist there to give you something like a centralized platform that doesn't just give you automation, which it does. It doesn't just give you all these wonderful reports and visualization of your data across multiple workloads, which it absolutely does, but really becomes a foundation for the communication of your governance guidance strategies across your org. Make it easy to implement these strategies. Make it easy to execute on remediation. Make it easy to ensure that our resources are consistent, that our naming conventions are in place, that our identities are being on and offboarded according to our protocols. Assist and accelerate our adoption rather than letting tooling get in the way, which a lot of times we see, um, you know, for lack of a better term, you, you sometimes see what I refer to as vendor sprawl, where you just have all these different tools that are plugging in to all these different concepts when you really could have a single unified experience that um, accelerates rather than gets in the way of uh, governance. Any other from Kasha or David, you want to uh, help expand on this point? Yeah, yeah. So I would like to expand on that because like oftentimes whenever I'm speaking at conferences or talking to people or, and whatnot, um, the challenge is like, how do I empower my, um, I don't know, governance, uh, if, if, let's say stakeholders from business, for example, or um, whoever to uh, have uh, knowledge, empower them with knowledge what's happening with, I don't know, service updates or roadmap or things like that. So uh, usually they rely on uh, messages in admin center that they then plug into uh, some sort of automation to, I don't know, do trash calls and uh, update uh, stakeholders on what's what's coming in Microsoft 365. Um, access to a platform like CoreView could completely eliminate that challenge. So I feel like this is something that we're not talking um, about enough is like how you can empower not only IT but people from business to have access to critical information that then again um, makes it all more manageable and easier to uh, implement. I guess that's that's the point I wanted yep. to make here. Yeah. You know there's another side of that coin too right in addition to empowering people to have access to these different things it's also about Again, we're talking governance here, so it's about limiting <laughs> visibility as well. So there's two sides to every coin. And again, tools like CoreView that have like super robust uh, segmentation and kind of role-based access augmentation capabilities allow you to kind of fine tune and dial in exactly where your communication needs to be robust and wide and where that communication needs to be more narrowed down. So I think it, it would be remiss not to mention both sides of that coin, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to, get your hands around all elements of the governance conundrum and give you the tools that you need to, to, to get to those uh, goals. In regard to benefits, again, this is pretty straightforward, but um, you know, standardizing governance means that our guidelines go across the entire org. That means that everyone understands potentially, or at least is in a better place. Um, obviously, minimizing the time to implementation of those defined guidelines uh, again, when you when you have good tools, that means you have tools that get you closer to those goals faster than slower. And as Kasha mentioned, you know, communication of the strategy with your stakeholders. And again, that may be a different answer depending on the stakeholder. But um, the point is, we we want to make it easy 
to um, communicate these strategies easy to have people adhere to the guidelines and not harder, which is often the case in the natural state. So in conclusion, um, I think what we really wanted to get across here is twofold. A, we think there are basically five blocks that you should start from. I've, I've said it several times and I'm reiterating one, one last time. If you take those five blocks and apply it to whatever aspect of your governance strategy you're focused on, that's a starting point. So um, all those I don't knows out there hopefully can change so you can have at least a starting point. The other side of it is we wanna understand what, what are the disciplines of cloud governance, at least from the Microsoft point of view, so that we know where to focus our efforts. Right? Do we need to put emphasis into management of cost in our environment? Do we need to put emphasis on how our identities are managed? Do we need to put emphasis in how resources are consistently um, provisioned across our organization, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding the disciplines and then taking that five-step block approach to application of those disciplines is to us the starting point to a successful governance strategy. And hopefully through today's webinar, you've been able to kind of get some of that from what we've been saying. Uh, I do want to quickly uh, just revisit our survey results now that we've had some time to kind of uh, expand on some of these topics. So again, almost the halfway mark in terms of the rating of the maturity of your organization's governance strategy. So I'm curious after talking today, do we think we might have at least a springboard toward getting um, that rating for your particular organization from the four to five mark up to the eight to nine mark. How, what, what things can you take, what steps can you take that have been talked about today that might get you closer to that 10? The biggest challenges you're facing, I'd love to resubmit this survey and get uh, new answers to see if any of these change. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Hopefully that maturity topic, which is kind of big on the on the uh, word map there, um, you know, again, that's the whole goal here is to get you more mature in your governance uh, approach. Uh, Kasha, anything you want to add here, or David? Nothing for me, no. Great. Nothing for me. Yep. And then this is the one that is the, is pretty important for me. How long does it take to discover breached policies or anomalies? 61% saying, I don't know. That to us at Coreview is the enemy of good governance. I don't know is one of the biggest um, kind of kicks in the shins, so to speak, for someone whose uh, you know, life passion is to have proper and effective governance. The more you can, the better you should minimize that percentage of I don't know and make your um, environment and your organization in tune with what your best practices, especially regarding um, uh, time to re remediation of breaches and anomalies. Uh, so yeah. And then finally, which the five disciplines take priority for you in terms of governance? I don't think we'll ever change the majority being security baseline, but I'm curious if uh, throughout today's webinar, anyone has any other ideas of what else is uh, particularly important from those five disciplines, cost management, um, identity baselining, resource consistency, or that final deployment acceleration topic. I'm curious if we'd see that change um, after the session. But anyway, things to chew on, things to think on. Um, so without further ado, I wanna jump into, while we have some time, a quick Q&A. So we've got a couple of questions in here. So I just wanna pop a couple out here. Let's see, so the first question, okay, so uh, we have the question, can we give some examples for automating naming conventions or do we have any suggestions or foundation in establishing one great question i'm happy to answer it but david kasha anything you'd like to add for the answer to that question examples of how to automate naming conventions yeah so you know that's one of the examples i already mentioned so this is something i helped customers build before uh we could uh, let's say i don't know uh lock in you could it depends on what what kind of naming convention and what what do you want to name like if it's i don't know department names or teams groups uh, there's multiple ways to tackle it so for example for new teams creation i had a customer that was uh leveraging Microsoft uh, form within their teams. Uh, so the end users were uh, submitting a, um, filling out the form. 
that was kicking in uh, basically a service now ticket because that was a, a, a that was even more automation that we can you know <laughs> talk about during this webinar. But it was kicking uh, in a, a service uh, tick now ticket, and this was then triggering a workflow in CoreView saying uh, you know create that group and. Now, before that, there was a there was a, like a, a step to check whether this naming is allowed or not. So uh, that could be one of the options. Uh, there is many, many times uh, different scenarios that we can tackle it. So it really depends what what you are asking for. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's see. I got a couple more here. We can jump through. Um, I like this one. How do we deal with resistance or pushback from stakeholders during the implementation of a, a new governance policy or guideline or strategy. Any takers? Well, I can take a shot at it. So I think communication is again the through line here. Um, the better, the, op the more open our channels of communication are, the better for these particular topics. So how do I deal with resistance or pushback? So A, understand the source of the pushback. Why is there resistance to a particular strategy? Um, the answer may or may not matter, frankly, in terms of depending on where your governance uh, definitions are, or you know, where the authority is. But it's, it is important to understand why when you have um, low adoption, what are the, the factors that, uh, that, that will factor in to that low adoption. So if it's about resistance, if it's about pushback, if it's a guideline that's impeding someone's productivity, it's good to understand those things. And if you have the opportunity to hedge bets and and um, and kind of uh, you know change things, uh, then so be it. It's not always the case, but it, at least if you understand the source, if you understand the emotional kind of value of the of the resistance, you can take the right steps to communicate accordingly and you know, help that set of resources to uh, get on board with the direction of the organization's governance strategy. So uh, a little bit of a tricky answer, but hopefully that's a good one. Uh, one more question, let's see. How often should we review, and, oh, this is a great one. How often should we review and update our governance rules and policies? Any takers? I want to jump on it, um, and... Yeah. Uh, let me say, uh, I don't see so relevant uh, the frequency you review and update uh, your rules and policy, but uh, it's uh, more important uh, how often uh, you verify that policy, because a lot of organizations today already have a great best practice uh, written in a book uh, that uh, are valid, uh, can work. The problem is uh, how often can you verify and check that that policy are applied? So here the problem is not keeping the rule update or the frequency you redefine or apply new policy, but with what frequency you can validate that the policy is well applied and the, your organization is compliant. Uh, if I'm just thinking to uh, the one of the survey questions that was uh, uh, how long we pay to discover an anomaly and uh, more than 60% say, I don't have idea. I would love for an organization to be able to say a while. Uh, so in a second, uh, as soon as uh, an anomaly is happen, as soon as uh, a policy is going out of compliance, I'm able to detect and, uh, and remediate. Absolutely. Yeah. And it and it basically just underlines that third building block, which is the evaluation and attestation. So this time at a macro level. So yeah, I mean, I think I agree 100% with David. It's not about the frequency that you uh, review. It's about how, what's the last time you actually validated that what you have in question, what you have in place is functional. So absolutely. That is a really great point. Thank you for that. So I think we're getting pretty, as a matter of fact, I think we're over on time. So why don't I jump over um, just a couple of calls to action. So we have this wonderful um, uh, our, uh, Gartner report out there that for you to um, download around how strengthening Microsoft 365 governance with an effective IAM team. This is a really, really interesting read, and we think it's pretty relevant to the, the discussion we've had today. 
but also, you know, if you want to go see a 90 second video of how CoreView approaches a lot of these topics, a lot of the things that we've kind of talked about throughout the webinar and the examples we've given, um, this second uh, QR code can give you a 90 second overview of exactly the kinds of things that we offer with our platform. Um, there was one other question, uh, which was, do we have any governance resources that we can share? Those things are on the way. Keep on the lookout for a, a really wonderful white paper uh, uh, written by the, the the crew that you've got on this uh, webinar today. But uh, just keep checking back with us. There's plenty more to come where this came from. And if there is a um, desire to see more webinars like this uh, around this topic, just let us know. And we're happy to, to continue that um, throughout uh, the, the, the future here and into the next year. So with that, I will thank everyone for their time today. We really, really appreciate it. We hope that this webinar was useful and had value for you. And please let us know whether it did or did not. Uh, and yeah, we hope to see you at the next one. Okay then. Take care, everybody, and thanks to all the panelists, and have a fantastic day.